We're at topic 17, looking at the Sufi mystics. And uh, the term Sufi has to do with the clothing that they wore, wool, wool, wool clothing, and they, uh, in, in oftentimes white, you know. And uh, they, were, they were the mystics. They were the mystics within the Muslim movement. And uh, one of the early mystics was, um, was Hassan of Basra. He died in 728. This would be about 100 years after Muhammad died. And um, he, um, he, he became like the prophet uh, that the Sufis seek to emulate. What are they seeking? The Sufis want to experience God. We've said that in Islamic orthodoxy, God sends his will down, but God himself never comes down to meet us. And the Sufis find that rather wearisome, to be submitting to God's law. We want to know God. We want to meet God. We want to experience God. And so as they search the Quran, they find some themes within the Quran which they feel are helpful. For example, Ah, they discover that Abraham is a wali. Amazing. Wali means friend of God. Abraham is a wali of God. Well, how can you be a friend of God and not know God, not have a relationship with God? You know, friendship with God. So if Abraham is a friend of God, maybe it's possible that we also could have experienced God, you see. And then they read on in the Quran, and they see there is to be no intercessor between God and humankind. Pray directly to God, no intercessor at all. But as they read on in the Quran, they say, oh, unless God appoints the intercessor. Oh. So maybe we could have intercessors that could help to bring us into the presence of God and represent us before God, who are chosen by God. Quran said, no intercessor unless God appoints him. So who might it be that God is appointing to be intercessor? Question. And then they read on in the Quran, and they see that the Quran says that we should remember the names of God. Dicker. Dicker. Remember the names of God. And as we know, there's 99 names for God, and devout Sunni Muslims will be repeating the names of God with the, the beads, the 99 beads that they have, uh, perhaps jovially, uh, occasionally. Um, our Muslim friends will say, there's actually 100 names for God. And the camel knows the 100th name. That's why the camel walks with his head so high, so proud. We human beings know only 99 names that God knows. The camel knows the 100th name of God. And by the way, this becomes a door that Christians often use. They'll say, by the way, that hundredth name of God has been revealed. It's been revealed. And the hundredth name is love. It's been revealed in the Messiah. <laughs> so it's not just the camel knows the hundredth name, you know. All who believe in the Messiah know this hundredth name as well. It's love, the hundredth name of God. So, anyway, you're supposed to practice dicker which is remembrance of the names of God. So as you remember the names of God, could it not be possible that you become absorbed into God, that you can experience God? And then as the Sufis read on in the Quran, they discover another theme. They read that nature is the ayat of God. In fact, ayat means signs of God. In fact, every surah in the Quran is called ayat likewise. So the Quran, every verse in the Quran is an ayat. Nature is permeated with signs of God. And so is the Quran, every verse in the Quran. Well, what is what use is a sign if it doesn't lead you to the one who is the originator of the sign, you see. So if the Quran and nature are signs of God, would not these ayats lead us to actually meet the one who
who has created these signs. Well, I just put signs everywhere and you'd never get anywhere. You know, If I see a sign to Moscow when we're driving uh, to catch my planes Saturday night, um, what good is that sign if I go and go and go and go and never get to Moscow? See? So these signs that came from God must be signs pointing to the experience of God. So those three forms, three themes, have very much informed Sufi theology. The theme that um, Abraham is a friend of God, a wali of God. The theme of intercession, that God does appoint intercessors who intercede for us. And the theme of Dicker, remembering the names of God over and over again. And the theme of Ayat, signs of God, which surely lead us to God himself. Um, and so the quest of the Sufi movement is to experience God. And these four dimensions of uh, the quest for God, which are found in the Quran, they find very, very helpful. So how does this all work out? Well, uh, some years ago, um, when I lived in Somalia, um, I a couple times went on pilgrimages to the shrines of the Sufi saints. Let me just play back one such experience. Um, a friend of mine, who also worked for us at the school that I was the headmaster of, um, told me that my village is having its annual pilgrimage to the shrine of the saint, of our saint, uh, at his tomb, at his tombstone. And I said, I would like to go with you. He says, great, you may. And so I accompanied my friend on the pilgrimage to his village and to the shrine of the saint who was their, their, uh, their eponymal saint. He was, had been a chief in their village. He had been a very wise imam. By the way, in the Sunni movement, the imam is the head of the mosque, the leader of the mosque prayers. He is the imam. Remember, in the Shia movement, the imam is the head of the whole community. That's not true in the Sunni movement. The imam is only the head of the mosque. So the imam of the village, he was the chief of the village, he became the imam of the village, very wise man, a man who, according to their legends, uh, could perform miracles. And so um, we came to the village, and then we pilgrimaged together out to his tomb where he was buried. And um, <clears throat> I noticed that people were taking dust from the tomb and sprinkling it over their bodies. And they were writing prayers and putting them on the trees nearby. And they were dancing and singing. And they were repeating the name of the imam. Um, and, um, and then, in addition to the name of the imam, let's say the imam was Abdul Qadr. What was, was uh, let's say he was Omar. I forget his name, but let's say Omar, for example. So they were singing to, in the name of Omar, and dancing in his name. And then they would add, add also, Abdul Qadr, Abdul Qadr. So I knew right away that this was a Gadiriya Sufi community. The Gadiriya Sufi community. Now the Gadiriya were founded by Abdul Qadr al Jilani and in Baghdad. Um, back there a thousand years ago, <laughs> approximately. Every Sufi community has a founding father at the, at, at the origins of that Sufi community. And this founding father, this founding imam, he has acquired inner secret knowledge from Muhammad. They call this the Isnad. So here is Abdul Qadr, and he, he stands within the chain of spiritual insight and authority called Isnad that comes from Muhammad. This Isnad has two strands to it. The one strand is genealogy. Most, Sufi found, most founders of Sufi 
of Sufi communities trace their genealogy back to Muhammad. So I have the blood of Muhammad flowing in my veins. So that's one stream of spiritual authority. The other stream is inner secret knowledge. So there's two isnads, two chains. The inner secret of spirituality that only the leader of the community knows. And where did he get it? Through it being passed down secretly, generation after generation, you know, from one sheikh, from one imam to the other, until it reaches this imam there in that little village in Somalia, who's now dead, you see. But as soon as they said, uh, in their chants, Omar is his name, and, uh, and then, and then Abdul Qadir, I knew right away, this is a Qadiriya um, Sufi community that traces its spiritual lineage right back to Abdul Qadir al-Jilani in Baghdad many, many centuries ago. And Abdul Qadir al-Jilani traces his spiritual authority and insight back to Muhammad. So that's one dimension of what was happening in this pilgrimage. Getting in touch with spiritual insight from Muhammad himself. Got it? Right there in our tiny little village in Somalia, illiterate village, we can't even read and write, you know, we're just a bunch of nomads. And here, right in our village, the spiritual authority of Muhammad himself is present. The inner secret knowledge was, was present in the soul of this imam who was our leader for many years, and that's why he could do miracles, you see, of healing and so forth. Now, of course, he in turn taught disciples, and so you have a new imam heading up the village community and so forth. In time, he will die, and he will also become a, a saint. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then, I, then they would pray to God, but as they prayed to God, I heard them repeating the name of this Omar, and this Abdul Qadr al-Jilani, and then Allah, 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 Allah. And Muhammad, they would get Muhammad in there as well. And so I uh, said to my, uh, my Muslim friend, what's going on here? Why did you come on this pilgrimage? And why are these prayers being offered here at the, at the tomb of the saint? And, um, uh, and why this praying to God in the name of this, this Omer? This is what he said. He said, we're sinners. And so God does not hear our prayers. At least we think he's not hearing our prayers because we're sinners. But this saint was a righteous man. And so we believe he, as if he is at the door of Muhammad. Well, he is at the door of Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, the founder of this Sufi community. And Abdul Qadir al-Jilani is at the door of Muhammad. And Muhammad is at the door of God. And so by praying to Omar, to Abdul Qadir, to Muhammad, we hope our prayers are getting through to God because these are very, very righteous men and they have inner secret knowledge. That's why we're praying. And I said, is this good Islam? He says, come, 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 come. We know it's not good Islam, but we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. Well, where do they get this notion to pray through intercessors? It goes from the Quran, see. There's no intercessor unless what? God has appointed him. So we hope, we believe God has appointed our Omar, from our own village to be an intercessor. That's, that's what we hope. We're not sure. So we're not sure it's good Islam. We don't know that he's been appointed, but we think so. We think so, that's our hope. And these, these, Sufi, these Sufi leaders, um, uh, saints, com compete with each other. Now, which one has the greatest, the greatest uh, authority? Which one um, is most effective? in answering our prayers as we pray to God in his name. Um, in, in Somalia, there's this story about to uh, the head of the Salihia uh, movement and the head of the Gadiria movement, which are two different Sufi communities. Uh, the founding imams of those two movements are walking together in the sun. And then a cloud appears. And so there's a cloud over them, just following them as they go protecting them from the terribly, terribly hot Somali sun. And so they get to arguing which one has the most spiritual authority. And uh, they can't resolve it. The Salihia founding saint and the Qadiriya founding saint says, uh, 
each one was claiming the most spiritual authority, but they, they, they couldn't. Read. So they say, okay, let's just separate. I'll go that way, you go this way. See which way the cloud goes. <laughs> and in this particular story, the cloud followed the Gaudiya saint. So obviously this is a Gaudiya story, you know, not a Salihiya story. <laughs> so there's that kind of competition oftentimes among the sutras. So then we went back to the village and they had uh, a goat, or goats were sacrificed. Um, and then we had a feast and then danced into the night with great joviality and joy. Um, and then we returned home, I guess, the next day. I think I slept out in the village that night. You see. So um, these, 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 these movements are very, very significant. And it, it's a kind of alternative movement to mainline Orthodox Islam. Uh, these Sufi communities um, are, um, uh, as I say, always built around a sheikh. The communities themselves are referred to as tariq, Tariq meaning the way or the path. And what is the way? The way is the way that the founder has, uh, has, has developed. And, um, and he is uh, he's showing the way to inner spirituality. And uh, so within these Tariq, they're often identifiable, identifiable communities where you have these, these uh, where they gather together, live together. And so these disciples come and they're instructed by the, by the, by the founder in this inner spiritual knowledge so forth. So um, they're, quite, they're quite influential. In order to gain this secret knowledge, as I say, you must become part of this tariq, this gathering, and you meet with the founder. He instructs you and so forth. These Sufi movements are often missionary movements. After the disciples have been instructed, they'll be sent out two by two to proclaim the grace that is found in their founding, in their founding imam and invite others to become part of the movement. In areas that are not Muslim, they will evangelize, lead people to become Muslims and become part of the Muslim movement. Uh, most of the Sufi communities will follow the Sharia. They're, they're not opposed to the Sharia. Um, many of them are noted as communities of peace, of, um, of Salam. In, in Somalia, which has always been strife-ridden, inter-clan wars and so forth, the Sufi communities were often viewed as islands of peace within the Somali setting. A horrible thing happened recently, though, which I, I'm, saddens me greatly, and that is that uh, there's a new movement within Somalia called Al-Shabaab, which means the youth movement. And the Al-Shabaab are very informed by the Wahhabist movement in Arabia, and they're saying these Sufi communities are heretical. They're heretical. And so they have been attacking them. And these, these are islands of peace within inter-clan Somalia. They're just remarkable. Islands of peace. And so the Sufi communities in Somalia have said, we have no alternative except to take arms and start to defend ourselves. And so this, 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 this legacy of being communities of peace and nonviolence that has lived on for years and years is being sabotaged with what is going on in Somalia today. I'm very sad about that. The imam brings blessing. They refer to this as baraka. as Baraka, the Imam brings blessing, uh, and his disciples meet around him, learn his inner secret knowledge of spirituality, and receive blessing from him. Maybe you're sick, he'll pray for your healing, and that sort of thing. Um, within Shia Islam, uh, they have a movement called Ifran. Ifran, which is not they don't refer to them as Sufi movements, but as, as Irfan within Shia Islam. But it's the same sort of theology. Getting close to God, being absorbed into God, and so forth and so forth. <clears throat> Let me pause for questions that you might have, then I have further comments. Yes? Barack Obama is something with uh, Muslim roots? Yeah, yeah. But Barak is, is, it means blessing. Yeah. And his middle name is Hussein. Mm -hmm. His father toyed with, with Islam for a while, so he was called Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. What's the difference between uh, Sunni and Tariqa? Sunni is the way of prophet, Tariqa is the path. The, the Tariqa is the path of the founding Imam, the founding saint of the particular Sufi community. And as I said, there's, there's, there's quite a number of Sufi communities uh, around the world, 
The one that was predominant in East Africa was Gadiria, but there was others as well, Ahmadi and Salihi and so forth. Gadiria was predominant. The mosque that we lived next to in Somali, in, in Nairobi, I referred to, was a Gadiria mosque. Say that Sunni, it's like a general big way of uh, Muhammad and Tariq, it's a more particular lower. Exactly, way. exactly. That says it very, very well. Yes, exactly right. Yes. Comment? Mm -hmm. The, the Galleria, is it anything for gathering or like, I mean. No, no, it has, it has to do with Abdul Qadr. Okay. The, the founding father of was called Abdul Qadr al Jilani. So it's the Abdul Qadr name. Okay. Gadiria, yes. So the second question is. What percentage number among the Islam? You say that 80% or 90% of Sunnis, 10% of Shiites, how much of Sufi, Sufis? How many of them? Are? Oh my, I, that, that's hard to say. Um, because, because be, well, no, it's huge. It's just huge. Because the number of Muslims who actually live in the communities is not so very large. But the influence, the influence of these communities is enormous. For many Muslims in their youth at a certain time will go to, a, go to a Sufi community and stay there for six months or a month or a week, you know, and be, uh, be um, bathed in the spirituality of this community. Um, and so uh, the influence is huge. Uh, some people say as many as 90% of worldwide Muslims have in some ways been influenced by Sufi Islam. Community look like a monastery? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's very similar to the monastic movement where you have these monastic centers and people come to be discipled for a while, uh, particularly the monastic movements in Egypt, uh, communities in Egypt come to be discipled for a while, but they don't stay there for a lifetime, but they're influenced by the spirituality of these Sufi communities. That would be like more like. I'm just trying to compare with the Christian movements. They were a little more like the Pentecostals with the spiritual ones. Yeah. Or something. And yeah. The, I've often thought that Pentecostalism and, and glossolalia and so forth are a kind of Christian spirituality that very much connects with what the Sufis are about. They will, they, will, they will repeat, for example, the name of God over and over again until they feel they have been filled with God. Uh, Allahu, Allahu. At the, at, the, at the mosque that, we, that, lived, that was across the road from us there in East Nairobi, every Thursday night they would meet together. And on and on, late into the night, you know, Allahu, 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 Abdukadr al-Jilani, Abdukadr al-Jilani. It was a Gadiriya mosque. You know, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Allahu, Allahu, Allahu. On and on they would go. And then they would stop and drink tea and they would eat, they would chew gut which was a, 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 um, a drug, a little plant that is a drug, used widely in East Africa by the Sufi communities. And eating this drug would lead you to lose your sense of personal identity. It's a kind of Brahmanistic Hindu idea mm -hmm. where you become absorbed into the universal, you see. In biblical faith, it's the I thou encounter. The personality is never absorbed into divinity. But within these Sufi movements, the emphasis is on absorption into divinity. And so it's a lot, and they would walk out of that at 11, 12 o'clock at night, the mosque, and I see them going up the streets, you know, in a daze. And they've lost their sense of identity through the repetition of God's name over and over again, and the, and the repetition of, um, of, of, of Abdukar Ajilani's name over and over again, and the chewing of this mirah and the drinking of tea. They would walk out of there in kind of a daze, and they felt that this sense of loss of personal identity Absorption into something universal is absorption into God, you see. So the Sufi quest, I would say, is more for the experience of God through absorption into God. Uh, there may be some exceptions to what I'm saying in some Sufi communities, but by and large, as I read the literature, that's the emphasis, you see, uh, rather than a relationship with God, an I-thou relationship with God, which is what biblical faith is about. When a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, it is never... Uh, perceived as obliterating our individuality, you know. <laughs> uh, it, the Holy Spirit affirms our personhood. Whereas in Islam, within Islamic Sufism, it is absorption into the universal uh, with, the, uh, with the goal of uh, the person being uh, absorbed into God. So you lose your sense of personal identity. So, yes. Kind of like I compare with Christians, like we're Mennonite and Baptist conservative. We believe in God, but we're dreaming about this spiritual 
events to meet the Jesus. So they claim that they, they meet the the spirits or something or God or something. So that's the one way we're not going to study there, but we're uh, yearning for this kind of experience. And that's why the Sufis' ideas is spread among the others, uh, the movement of the Islam, because for them it's like everybody yearning to have this kind of special spiritual things, right? I don't know. Yes, some years ago, um, we were having a, a, a day studying Islam in Philadelphia and invited a professor from Temple University from their Islamics department to speak to us about Islam. She was a Syrian doing her doctorate at Temple University. And at the top of the board, at the beginning of the day, she put God. At the bottom of the board, she put humankind. She was a Sunni Syrian Muslim. As she talked throughout the day, she would occasionally say, we cannot know God. He sends his will down, but we cannot know God. By the end of the day, that line on the board had become a thick wall. You see. Now the Sufis say, but we want to know God. Surely a way must be found to know God. Within Islam, God reveals his attributes, but he does not disclose himself. We talked about the burning bush, God coming down and meeting Moses. Now, by the way, the Quran talks about the burning bush. And I often talk about that with Muslims. Look, what's this about? Come and look at the biblical account and you'll see what happened here. God came down and met Moses. I thou encounter. And that's just at the heart of biblical revelation. God taking the initiative to meet us, you see. So we do know God. God discloses himself in I thou encounter. But in her statement, she was making it clear that God is the unknown and unknowable one. By the end of the day, that white line had become a thick, thick wall. The Sufis say that's not enough. And a little hint that we can know God is this Abrahamic passage. Abraham is a friend of God. That means you've got, you got to know your friend. You've got to know him, you know? So let's find a way. And so this Sufi track is, is the way to try to, to, find, to find God. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. As we look at the New Testament message concerning Jesus, we find, I believe, that Jesus, particularly as described and revealed in the book of Hebrews, is an enormously wonderful fulfillment of what the Sufis are looking for. For example, in Hebrews, Jesus is the intercessor. On that particular journey with my friend to that uh, Sufi community there in Somalia, as we were leaving, I said, is this good Islam? I mentioned this. He says, no, it's not, but we don't know what to do. We need an intercessor. And so we hope that our eponymal Im imam will bring us into the presence of God. I said, I can understand your problem because no one can be an intercessor unless God appointed him. And I said, I have very good news to share with you. I shared on my walk back home with him. And that is that God has appointed the Messiah as intercessor. In fact, we read in the scriptures that God has sworn, Hebrews 4 to 10, there are all those chapters in there in Hebrews, God has sworn and will never change his mind, the Messiah is intercessor forever. Why? Well, he is without sin. He fully understands who we are. He has lived among us, fully participating in all that we experience without any sin. He died for our sins. So in him, we find forgiveness of sins. You say, God doesn't hear you because of your sinfulness. Jesus, the Messiah, in him, we have forgiveness because of what happened on the cross. These lambs and rams that you're slaying here in connection with this pilgrimage, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. He is the lamb slain for our forgiveness. And he's resurrected from the dead and sitting at God's right hand, interceding for us, you see. And God has sworn, you are therefore <laughs> the eternal intercessor. And so we pray to God in the name of Jesus. Shortly thereafter, 
shortly thereafter, the pump at our high, at high at the school that, that I was directing broke down. And we worked at that pump for days trying to get this thing fixed. It was a jet pump and we just were not successful. So we were finally ready to close the school. So one night I and my colleague were out there trying one more time to take this whole thing apart and try to get the thing working. We had reinstalled it in the well. I think we've done this a dozen, dozen times. And if it didn't work that night, we're going to announce tomorrow the school is closed until we can get a new pump from Nairobi or wherever. And as I was ready to pull the rope, uh, a number of the students were all, the students were just all around me. A couple of them stepped forward and says, we have heard that Jesus is the intercessor. Well, I'd just been sharing that on the way back from the grave. <laughs> and that you had the authority to pray to God in the name of Jesus. And he hears your prayers. Yeah, I said, that's true. Okay, we've all decided to pray now before you pull that rope. Well, I said, we have been praying. No, we believe you have been praying, but you pull, you pray right now. Now, remember, in Somali, it is illegal to propagate Christianity. But I'm being commanded by these Muslims, pray in the name of Jesus. And I said, uh, we have, they, no, please, right now. And so I prayed in the name of Jesus that that pump would work. Of course, I added, as we always do, and I think it's appropriate, if it's according to your will. We don't want to be presumptuous and demand, but we think water flowing for this school is the right thing. And so in the name of Jesus, we bring that petition to you, our Heavenly Father. I pulled the rope and the pump pumped water. You wouldn't believe it. It went for, I think, a couple years without any further trouble. <laughs> now, we're not presumptuous, you know. We have the authority to pray in the name of Jesus. We know God hears our prayers, but he has the final decision on what is best. We don't, we don't presume to know, but we bring our requests boldly before him. And... Um, the Jesus as intercessor is very, very good news. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the infilling of God. You know? <laughs> so we know God, but brothers and sisters, not in the sense that we become absorbed into God and lose our identity. One of the sad things about the Sufi movement in East Africa is drug addiction. Seriously. You go to northeastern Africa, up there in Ethiopia, and you just see fields and fields and fields of these drugs that are just dementing the populace. You know, why? Because we want to become absorbed into God so badly, and this drug helps us lose our sense of personal identity, a sense of involvement in the universal. You know, that quest, which is taking you in a direction which is not helpful. Of course, the Orthodox Muslims say, this is not the way to go. And the Gospel says, it is not the way to go. The fullness of the Holy Spirit and the blessings that come with the fullness of the Holy Spirit free us from any drug culture and invite us into a right and joyous relationship with God, you know. But David Schenck does not lose his identity in that relationship. God affirms my personhood. It's the ideal relationship we have with God. And Baraka, the opportunity to pray in the name of Jesus for the healing of people, his blessing upon our homes, you know, just to walk in, 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 permeated in prayer. The imam there in Nairobi, living at the mosque across from us, this Gadidia mosque, occasionally became ill. And I would go over and visit him. And I would say, may I pray for you in the name of Jesus the Messiah for your healing? Please do. And I would lay hands on him and pray for his healing in the name of Jesus. And Jesus touched him with healing a number of times, you see. We have that authority. And the prayers of the church in the name of Jesus within these um, contexts that have been informed by Sufi thinking is a wonderful ministry that the church brings into, into the relationship with, 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 with Muslims. Um, and, um, um, and the community of faith, you know, these tariqa, these communities that they gather around the imam to receive his inner wisdom and so forth. I think the imams sort of function like the pastor does in the congregation. But for the churches, the congregations, to be communities of discipling believers, where they gather together regularly around the, around the man of God who teaches the word of God. Uh, not inner secret knowledge, no, it's a knowledge free for all, you know. Come all who wish and drink. Everybody's welcome. And we lead people into that experience of meeting Jesus in the 
fullness of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just saying, as I see it, the Sufi movement is a revelation of a deep yearning within the soul of Islam, which is fulfilled in Jesus, and fulfilled in the life and ministry of the church, and fulfilled in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's how I see it. Amen. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.